good morning and welcome to this morning's reflection. And I'm glad that we could be together again this morning and share this time together. It certainly delights me and gives me great joy. If you hear any strange noises in the background, it's rather a fat Jack Russell that is snoring and I really can't do anything about him. And I don't really want to put him outside. Shame. Poor Jack Russell. Today's reflection is quite difficult. And Albert Nolan, as he writes about this, which is the kingdom of God and money, um, rarely lays before us some huge challenges. So let's take a moment to read about what Scripture has to say about the kingdom of God and money. The pursuit of wealth, the desire for wealth, is diametrically opposed to the pursuit or the desire for the kingdom of God. You can't want both of them at the same time. Mammon and God are like two masters. If you love and serve the one, you must of necessity reject the other. And he cites Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No compromise is possible. Jesus' sayings about money and possessions are frequently regarded as the hardest in the gospel. And many times we as Christians tend to water them down because it's much too difficult to live with them as they stand. The most astounding statement about the kingdom of God is not that it was near, but that it would be the kingdom of the poor and that the rich, as long as they remain rich, would have no part in it. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 26. It is impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom, as impossible as it would be for a camel to be threaded through the eye of a needle. Mark tells us that even Jesus' disciples were astounded by this. And they asked, What kind of kingdom will this be? In that case, they said, Who can be saved? And Jesus gazed at them. For men, he said, It is impossible, but not for God, because everything is possible for God. In other words, it would be like a miracle to get the rich into the kingdom, and the miracle would not be getting them in with their wealth. The miracle would be getting them to give up their wealth, so that they could enter the kingdom of the poor. This is what the rich young man in the gospel story was asked to do in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. But because he had too little faith in the kingdom, too little faith in the kingdom of God, and relied too heavily upon his financial security, the miracle did not take place. God's power could not work in him to achieve the impossible. There will be no place in the kingdom of God for the rich. There will be no rewards and no consolations for them. In the parable about the rich man and the beggar, Lazarus 
is given no other reason why the rich man should not be so dramatically excluded from all rewards except that he was rich and that he did not share his wealth with the beggar. This too is all that this rich man wants to warn his brothers about. But who would believe it? It follows that the it follows that setting one's heart on the kingdom of God and subscribing to its values entails selling one's possessions. Jesus expected his followers to leave everything home, family, land, boats, nets. And he warns them that they need to sit down and count the cost. Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 33. Something more than a mere almsgiving is being demanded here. Jesus is asking for a total and general sharing of all material possessions. He tried to educate the people to a detachment and carefreeness about money and possessions. He said they should not worry about what they were to eat or what they were to clothe themselves in. And he said to the man who takes your cloak from you, do not refuse your tunic. Give to everyone who asks, and do not ask for your property back from the man who robs you. Lend without any hope of return. And he says, would you have a party? Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, because they cannot pay you back. This is indeed challenging for us. And so let us... Today, give time to just thinking about what this means for us. So let us pray. Father, you challenge us about our relationship with our possessions. We cling to them. They give us status. They protect us. And I suppose in many ways they prevent us from relying on you entirely. And our attitudes about this we find very difficult to change unless you change them. So grow in us a heart that is able to let go and able to rest in your provision and your provision alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.